Ladies and gentlemen, this evening's performance of The Diz Explorers will begin in two minutes. Excellent listening locations are still available all around Showcase Promenade. Due to the use of alcohol and opinions around the lagoon, for your safety, we request that you remain on the promenade side of all railings. During the show, please watch your step and take small children firmly by the hand. Once again, this evening's performance of The Diz Explorers will begin in just two minutes. Thank you. Welcome to another episode of the Diz Explorers Podcast, where each week we explore the many avenues of the great Disney universe. This week, we've got a full crew, and I am glad we do. So joining us tonight is Adrian. Hello. And Jessica. Hey, everybody. And Miss Melanie. Hi, y'all. And Mr. Milford. Hey, hello. This week, we've got a very, very special guest. His name is Ben, uh, but many of you may know him as Walt's Frozen Head on the Twitter machine. And also, if you have dived a little deeper than that, Walt's Frozen Head is going to be starring in his own movie. <laughs> so we've invited him on so we can uh, speak to him about said movie and his process and how it was making a movie with a frozen head. <laughs> <laughs> so Ben, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get started with, I guess, uh, just asking questions and stuff, why don't you give us a little? I guess the most, the first question that comes to mind, I guess, is a good way to introduce it. Is what? How did the project first come about? Like what? What made you? Th gave you the idea to, to do this, or or who gave you the idea, or was this something? You know, you, you thought about. You know, as a kid or just, you know, um, I think every Disney fan has sort of speculated on, you know, what would Walt say if he was allowed to visit the park? Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that's that's necessarily uncommon. And, and obviously this idea of Walt being frozen has really been in the pop culture for, you know, 50 years almost. I, uh, and, uh, you know, it was kind of the idea of marrying those two. Um, it, it, it just became so logical that to me that like this this was a fantastic story and this was a story that people were were interested in and they would really want to see. Um, and so I was in film school at the time and a few of my uh, buddies were just kicking around uh, ideas for for projects and uh, I think the title really came first. That was the first thing. The further <laughs> adventures of, of Walt's Frozen Head uh, got pitched by someone and. Um, you know, I came home and, and t mentioned it to my wife, and uh, she said, "That's that's a movie we've got to make." And you know, here it is, uh, five years later, and uh, the movie is uh, almost finished at this point and ready for to be seen. Awesome! Very so. Your wife is working with you on the project. Oh, not really. I okay. just you know gotcha. <laughs> mentioned it passing. Okay. Um, oh, cool, cool. So awesome! That's great. <laughs> that's. So, oh, so five years you've been working on this. Wow, that's that's a long time. So, so what came? Obviously, the idea came first, but then what? What I guess comes next in this process? Do you uh, write some sort of a screenplay or a script, or do you try to th think about which actors or actresses you you would think you'd you'd cast in it? Like, how does the so, process go? I guess. So the the we from the very beginning I knew kind of the general outline of the story and and my general technique is to uh, um, use note cards and put note cards up on a uh, you know old-fashioned uh, um, I can't even remember corkboard corkboard um, and so basically each note card is a scene and as soon as I have an idea I write it on a note card and I stick it up about in the movie where it goes and as I sort of build that then I you know have a movie in front of me and I can tell, oh, okay, this one's going to be about 90 minutes long based on the number of scenes that are in there. And so I sort of knew the beats that I was going to have to have because it was Walt visiting Disney World. And so Walt needs a reason to visit Disney World. Walt needs to learn something as he visits Disney World. And, you know, that, that all just sort of came together. But then 
obviously some, there needs to be more characters. I had to really build out the world, and that went through just a lot of different changes before we got to the part where we were even considering um, you know, casting or, or production design or anything like that. Gotcha. So I have a question. When mm -hmm. you were thinking about kind of the scenes and were you trying to think what would be easiest to shoot in Disney World? Is that how you sort of decided where you'd want him to go in the park? How did how did you do that? I mean, there was a little of that. Um, you know, practical concerns are always, especially when you're making a mo uh, movie for essentially no money. Um, you're pretty close <laughs> to no money. Uh, obviously, we love our Kickstarter backers who are incredibly generous in funding us. Um, but, you know, we're the coffee budget on a real movie. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, practicality was a bit of an issue. And I think for us, it was more of a question of where we could realistically get away with some gorilla scenes than uh, um, anything like that. Um, so, for example, we have a long scene that takes place on the Haunted Mansion ride. Um, it, it was in one of our early trailers, and what we did was we real we thought, like, okay, that's a ride vehicle we can actually construct. You know, there, there's more difficult ride vehicles, but that, you know, scene took uh, got shot on a soundstage. Oh, cool. um, in a, a uh, doom buggy that we built the sides in front of. Um, and then we cut that in with some uh, in-park footage of the ride. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's uh, I'm not saying it's totally seamless, but it's it's pretty good. You know, you, you definitely buy the emotion of the scene. So that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome right there. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, I just I, I don't know where to start. I feel like there's like a million and one things that I'm just so very curious about. It's just, I mean, the whole process is curious to me too. Uh, just filmmaking in general, but especially like a, I guess a, a fan made film such as this. Cause like you said, you're not, you're not getting backed by millions and millions of dollars and a big studio production company. That's going to, you know, just give you any, anything on a whim. You know what I mean? So, right. So as far as, so how often did you, or how much did you, I guess it, maybe you answered it in, with the practicality part, but how, how much, I guess when it started coming down to filming, did you did you want to get as far as real in the park footage versus doing stuff on a small soundstage like you did with the dune buggy you just mentioned? Was there like a certain amount that was acceptable to you that I this really needs, to, to really sell it, needs to be the actual footage that... You, well, this, you know, the project went through a couple pure mutations early on, and um, the one of the earliest versions, it was not going to be Walt Disney. It was going to be some other very close to Walt Disney, but not quite, and we were not going to sneak into the park, and we were not going <laughs> to, you know, it was going to it was gonna be very, you know, obviously people know who it is, but it's not, right. you know, legally. <laughs> and then um, at some point, you're just coming out with so many, like, convolutions and like little in jokes and like oh this isn't what this movie's gonna be like this is this is it, it's it's we're, we're we have to create so many jokes in order to get to the movie we want that at some point it just becomes easier to say yeah we'll we'll chance it and just call it walt disney you know just make <laughs> it actually disney world um and you know that kind of just is what we wound up doing then uh, but yeah, on some hard drive somewhere, I've got the early version of the script, which I think was like, I can't even remember the, the character's name, like Walter something. It was it was not Disney, though. It was something <laughs> else. Um, and it just was wasn't good. Like it, it turned into it turned into the cynical, um, you know, parody instead of uh, a more what I think of as much more of a heartwarming, um, you know, kind of character family film. Gotcha. Right, right, right. Yeah, then it kind of loses sight of your original intention at that point. Yeah. Okay. So how much did you get? So any... I yeah, I don't know if I actually wound up answering the question. No, no, that's okay. No, no, I, I don't know that the question made sense to begin with. So I'm just trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the, like there's like I said, there's so much swirling down, and I'm not, I'm not at, as the rest of everybody knows on here because I say it every time we have some sort of a topic because like I'm horrible at pre-planning. I'm I like the spontaneity more, so I generally don't try to write stuff down because then I feel like I'm reading off of a off of a piece of paper, uh, which is you know probably not the best uh, process for something like this. But <laughs> <laughs> but I know Jessica has has questions, so she's always uh, she's prepared. 
<laughs> yeah, I can I can jump in. Um, yeah, Joe, yeah, don't let me be the only one to, you know, I'll go on forever if you let me. So, yeah, please <laughs> well, cut me since... off and jump in with better <laughs> questions. <laughs> no, they're not better. They're just <laughs> different. <laughs> um, but because you were talking about the legal kind of issue that you thought about with the name, have you heard anything from Disney or during the process? Did you kind of talk to anyone about how can we make sure we don't get in trouble for this? Or was are you just saying, you know what, we'll go for it and see what happens? Um. We did talk to some people, um, uh, both some entertainment lawyers, and then the, the uh, I was going to UCF in their film program at the time, the school council. Um, then you know they point us to some resources. Um, we believe that what we are doing is 110 percent covered by fair use, um, and that if it got to court, we would just be totally vindicated in our position that this is a perfectly legal, legitimate film to make and distribute. Um, obviously there's a large corporation with lots of lawyers who might feel otherwise, and we <laughs> hope that they will continue what they've been doing so far, which is just ignoring us. Yeah. I feel that's probably the course they would take as well. I mean... Yeah, I think that's what they did for some film that people shot in Disneyland, too, if I remember a few years ago. But I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It seemed like, not to go off topic, but it seemed like they were really a lot more worried about, of like, the the Facebook live streams and all the periscopes. Like, last year, that seemed to be the big thing. They were shutting stuff down and, and not allowing certain things to be constantly uh, streamed all over the place. It seemed like the, they were really hot on that more than something along these lines, which I have not... Other than the trailer, I haven't seen, so I'm purely speculating. I, I, there's probably less theme park footage in your in in the movie altogether than what people can go and watch on YouTube any given day. Oh, I, I mean, certainly. <laughs> the, there's how many hours of theme park footage is on YouTube yeah, at this point? It's, it's you insane, know? right? Exactly. Oh, I know. <laughs> Every single ride, right? Every yeah. single everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, just today I looked like I was trying. I was talking to somebody on Twitter and mentioned the old version of. Uh, countdown to extinction like and this narrate ride narration existed for like two months before they replaced it i found the youtube link and sent it on so yeah. you know it's like it's all out there so uh yeah. yeah that is for sure okay so so now you're heading down to so i guess what was all right so you got script you got your idea you have your uh, you know the, the practical thought behind it of, of what you can actually film and mm -hmm. live in the parks and what you're going to do in, uh, using other resources. So now it comes time to where you want to film in the park with, with some of the, I, I guess before that, how, how did you, how did you come about choosing who you choose, who you chose? I mean, looking at the uh, cast that you, that you picked and the only name that I know is Ron Schneider. Any of the other people, I do not know who any of them are. So are these, uh, besides Ron, were any of these people like uh, people you went to school with or contacts through going to film school or local no, friends? Uh, <laughs> we held open auditions in Orlando. Oh, nice. Uh, but we did, not, uh, we did not publicize the intended name of the film. Gotcha. Um, we actually uh, sent out our audition calls under the name The Florida Project. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> which at that point, you know, in retrospect, uh, obviously there's another um, uh, very successful independent film called The Florida Project. Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, but at that time, that was at least if it was in production, we were unaware of it and it wasn't on IMDb. So right, right. Right, right. Um, obviously, it doesn't exist if it's not there. Um, <laughs> True. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I still, I still uh, am thinking back to, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some actor who like remembers that they didn't audition for the Florida Project and thinks like <laughs> our call was the one with you know William Defoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, we held up, we held open auditions. Uh, we got a terrific response. Um, Orlando actually has quite a large. Um, I'd say like professional and semi-professional acting community. So a lot of people who do the shows in the theme parks and do live theater and do the dinner shows and do the, you know, et cetera and so forth. Like there's a lot of talent here and a lot of people who are really interested in doing more film work. Um, even when film work is, is closer to our level than the, the, you know, big Hollywood stuff. Right. Um, so it's, it's really a great place to shoot a movie from that perspective. Um, because you can just get the a lot of really talented people who have gravitated here for park work or just because there's a lot of creative stuff going on in the uh, town. 
Um, so we, you know, cast from the people we had uh, show up, basically. And uh, um, we were just incredibly, uh, you know, incredibly thrilled with the people we got. Cool. That's, you know, and now explaining all that about the uh, people who act in the live shows and all the other non-character roles in and around Disney World, that's, that's I, I kind of knew that. Going, I just didn't think of it in the, in the respect of with these actors, and in the re- I was thinking in the music side of it because, mm-hmm. been playing drums, not on a professional level, just as a hobby for many years, for thirty years. So I, one of my favorite things to watch at the park is the Jammeters in Epcot, and anytime I see them, I always go and chat with them afterwards. And there's one fellow I always chat with every time, and I do remember asking them if that's their only. If if this is the, all they do, and and one or two of them, yes, this is the, that's the only gig they do, and there are other ones who play in other bands, doing the same thing in and around Orlando. So I guess it's the mm-hmm. same thing as with the actors, just on the music musician side. So, I'm yeah, related but not related. You know what I mean? No, exactly. <laughs> um, the the young woman who sings, we we've got a, a kind of not a musical number per se. You know, it's not a musical, but a uh, uh, an original song in the film okay. and the young lady who sings it is Nemo four or five times uh, and probably more like eight or ten times a week at the uh, um, oh, Finding right. Nemo show oh in Animal uh, Kingdom oh nice in Animal Kingdom yes oh that's so, uh, cool yeah so it's um, it, it is a great place to find really talented people um, and talented people who are you know interested in doing sort of some side projects and um you know, it, so it really is a fantastic place to, uh, uh, from the talent side, to get those kind of expertise. Gotcha. Those kind of that kind of real talent. Right, right, right. Awesome. Oh, that's good to hear. It's good to know too. If you're ever looking for anybody, <laughs> anybody to do any acting for you or something. So as far as for Ron though, because for if everybody doesn't know, he was one of the two original walk around Dreamfinder characters in the representing the original Dreamfinder from the first incarnation and the only good incarnation of <laughs> Journey in, Journey into Imagination. Uh, and if you were lucky enough to have gone to the parks during that time in the 80s, and I don't, I can't think, remember off the top of my head when he stopped, uh, I want to say probably in the early 90s. Uh, I believe he stopped being Dreamfinder in the late 80s. Okay. Uh because at one, because I, the, my first trip was 1990, and we were disappointed to learn that there was no way I could have seen him be Dreamfinder. Because I do pretty distinctly remember meeting a Dreamfinder. Right. I just wasn't sure. It was the which other. One. It was the other fellow, and I can't think of his name mm-hmm. for the. I believe. Name. I think Steve Taylor. Maybe? Yes, I believe you're correct. Yeah. Yep. You're right. Um, Ron was also the Dreamfinder for all of the promotional stuff that occurred in the park in the early days. Yes, he including, was, including like the opening c- ceremonies and. Um, the the special with Danny Kay that that yep. broadcast and um, you know a lot of, uh, he, and actually he was in a film that premiered or that was going to be shown in the Magic Eye Theater if they didn't finish Forbidden uh, not um, Magic Journey I almost said Forbidden Journey yeah <laughs> if they if they didn't finish Magic Journeys in time um, but they they finished Magic Journeys in time and they and they yanked that one um, that one still can be found on YouTube somewhere so. Yeah, so he was definitely involved with the company long before he was cast as the Dreamfinder. Mm-hmm. Did he audition as well for the role, or did, or was it something you knew you wanted him to play? It was. It was a very different process. We shot the entirety of the film um, without Walt. Um, oh, we okay. didn't know who it was going to be. Um, we had reached out to some people, um, sort of, you know, actors in their in their of an older generation. I would right. say. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and just really put a bunch of feelers out, um, and and uh, we eventually contacted Ron and asked if he would submit a video audition, and he did, and he was wonderful, and we chose Ron. Um, so it was almost that simple. Awesome. I had met him at an event prior. Um, I don't doubt he remembered me, but you know, went up to him, shook his hand, thanked him for his work because it was hugely influential on me as a kid. Um, his part in in creating that character of the Dreamfinder, at least. Yeah. Um, even if I didn't meet him personally. And, uh, uh, you know, that was that. And at that point, I even know in my head, like, we're, we're needing a we're needing a Walt. And, uh, you know, it was months, months after that, 
that we reached out. And uh, I am really glad it worked out like it did. Excellent. Yeah. I imagine you would be, yeah. I mean, like I said, the the trailer is great. The trailer is great. The little bits of, of him in it are, are, are absolutely uh, awesome. So I can't wait and to see And you can find thing. that trailer by going to YouTube.com and uh, searching Walt's Frozen Head trailer. <laughs> yep, definitely, yeah. <laughs> Got to get my plug in there. No, I'll let you plug away at the, at the end. You can give, give as much as you, all your ways to find you everywhere. And I'll include them in the show notes as well, just so everybody can... Uh, can get their eyes on it for sure so how was it filming in the parks like what what did you have you know big camera equipment with you carrying around was it did you try to make it not as obvious that you were doing things you know did, did you catch any resistance or ask to leave or stop doing that i know it's a multi-part question but i'm just, just trying to get it all out <laughs> you know one park thing so, so the park footage consists of about 20 minutes in the film. And we had created a really a, a battle plan going in. At that point, um, we hadn't shot anything else in the film and we had to do, knew we had to do a Kickstarter to get some more production money before we had started. And we also knew that once we went public, it was going to be much harder, if not impossible, um, for us to get the park footage. Um, right. Just because Disney would be on the lookout for us. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, with the element of surprise and with a game plan that consists of four days of shooting on property, um, we went in with the smallest professional cameras we could get our hands on and some incredibly uh, high-end professional lenses because that's really one of the, the huge parts of capturing, you know, filmic quality images. Mm -hmm. And we had laid everything out on a soundstage. We had gone on scouting trips. Um, we knew every angle, we knew every shot, um, we had our game, uh, our backup plans, and we had all our equipment carried around on a stroller, <laughs> well, which served as our, um, as our uh, portable cart, and nice. at one point, Dolly as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that was, that was the, the plan. It was mostly shot on a monopod, which is, you know, a tripod yep. with with you know that that had, it actually had a three feet at the very bottom so i guess it was a tripod with really short legs but gotcha. uh, yeah 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 <laughs> um you know so so we we would go into an area we would know exactly what we were doing we would call action and cut um with some prearranged signals and we would try to not be looking all in the same direction we also had uh, just almost hourly footage drops where we sent the footage that we had shot for the day out um to go get uh yeah, and just go be taken care of at an off-site location if thing, anything went wrong. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Was it hard to get through security with those cameras? Um, not when you repack the cameras in really cheap-looking camera bags. Ah. So, we, yeah, we took uh, two or three really cheap-looking camera bags and uh, um, just put all our thousands and thousands of dollars in borrowed film school uh, film equipment into them. And uh, whizzed right through with a thank you and have a nice day. <laughs> yeah, you tend to get noticed when you start rolling in with pelican cases. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah would no, say that's so. obviously that's what they were all packed in originally. You know, the kind of the hard shell, professional looking. Um, so they all they all came out of that, and they all went into like Canon DSLR bags. Nice. So that's how we uh, took care of that problem. In a stroller. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. That was the. That was the whole thing. Nice. That works for booze, too. Not that I know anything about that. But <laughs> strollers are wonderful things, you know, for kids and stuff. <laughs> okay, so so you really didn't have any encounters with security or people wondering what the hell you were doing. And you just kind of uh, just kind of looked like a bunch of funny people taking videos of people doing silly things at Disney World. Which, if you look around sometimes, people with... The, now with Instagram and Snapchat and everything else, it seems like a common practice of people are holding their phones, obviously, not video equipment, but it's not out of the realm for a group of people to be like, you know, in a in a place filming something, I guess. Right. Maybe that helped too, I guess, since if you're not standing there with a giant camera on your shoulder with, you know, <laughs> microphones everywhere. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so the stuff with... I'm trying to refer back to the trailer now. So the, the so the few scenes, like I believe there's one you're walking through the castle and you have the main character has Walt holding him in his little frozen 
I don't know, cage, I guess you could say. I don't know what the official term would be. Yeah, so, I think we called satchel or bag. Okay. Was that done post filming, I guess? I'm trying I can't think of the right terminology. Was that cut in after of the of the of the actual frozen head or is that a, a prop that was carried around during the filming? I, I'm not completely sure which uh, which image you're talking about, but we had the bag, which was this bright red thing with a flap on the front Yep. Um, that could open and close, and that's what we used in the park. That's okay. kind of Walt's disguise, if you will. Gotcha, okay. And, and then inside of that, though not actually inside of that, when we were shooting was a canister, you know, metal-looking, uh, about maybe two feet tall, um, that Walt is actually in for the majority of the film. And when we were shooting, that canister just had a green screen uh, attachment on it um, that is then replaced in post-production with the footage of Ron. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was getting So at. there are a few moments when, when they lower, the, they lower the, um, the flap on the front of the bag, but uh, those are, you know, in, in, in the park, but uh, most of the time he's, he's sort of behind his flap and can see through the mesh. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So I guess logistically wise, did did all of the other actors involved in it and actresses have to do any filming in the parks or was all their roles mostly uh, offsite stuff? So, yeah. So there were two actors who came into the park, the, the guy playing Peter and then the, uh, the um, girl playing his daughter. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so... That's uh, Daniel Cooksley and uh, Catherine Jenkins, mm -hmm. and they were the only two actors in the park. And then we had a pretty small crew um, that accompanied us um, there. Uh, the rest was all sort of off-site in, in various locations, some of which substituted for places on Disney property, um, like the Utilidors and, and places like that, right, um, some right. backstage areas. And then uh, um, some of which were just other locations as the uh, sort of story required. Okay, cool. That's, I guess that's probably easier doing it that way than having to get everybody into the park <laughs> all, all the time <laughs> well, for every scene, I guess. Yes and no. You know, going with a very small crew it has definitely has its advantages. Um, like, we had a crew of, um, gosh, over 30 crew members one day for some of the cryogenic lab stuff. Wow. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it's a lot of people to be uh, organizing and, you know... It, 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 when you're in the park, it's just, you know, you've got so many people and you only need so many bathroom breaks and you only need, you know, like yeah. there, there, there is an advantage to working small. I really got both ends of that, um, you know, on this project, definitely the largest crew I've ever had on some days and, and pretty much the smallest crew I've ever had on some other days. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Wow. 30 people. Jeez. A lot. <laughs> That's a lot. What did you yeah. use for the set for the, the lab? Uh, the cryogenic room was... Orlando Brewing Company. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, yes. And so all those uh, large vats, which have, you know, new labels and things affixed to them, were uh, uh, in the process of making beer. Um, <laughs> the wall behind Peter was was brought in. We built it for this, you know, that. And we brought in a lot of propping and, um, and then sort of rearranged some things in there and brought in our lights. And, you know, it was actually fantastic because they had professionally – install equipment that our lighting could hook up to because it, it really does take special um, special equipment to run the, the level of light you need for a film. Um, and most houses just can't do it. We had to rent generators the days that we were shooting in, in houses. Yeah. You know, so it's uh, it was a really fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, resource that we were able to use. We were there for two days. The downside was it wasn't air conditioned in the <laughs> middle of summer. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a refrigerated room that the production team would frequently slip into to plan the next shot <laughs> and then step out of to uh, to go and, and film. Uh, don't, we also let the cast kind of literally chill in there. Yeah, for, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, because the cast is wearing or the, the, the executives in that scene are all wearing suits. And, yeah. you know, it's uh, they, they're, it, it's warm. And, you know, yeah. this was filmed in the middle of... You know, in Orlando, most of it. So it was a it was a warm warm environment generally. I can imagine. And then plus you have all the all the lights which are generating. You know, oh, exactly. Tons yeah, of, not tons of better. heat. Right, right. <laughs> you know, people talk about MGM stopping the filming in Orlando, and honestly, the summers are the problem. Uh, the rainstorms and the heat. It just makes a lot of filming very 
difficult. So the the upsides are a lot of talent. The downsides are, oh gosh, the 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 weather is harsh. Yeah, I I can imagine. I never thought of it in that respect. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, because realistically, what you've probably got like six decent months that weather. You know, when it's not hurricane season and not a thousand percent humidity. <laughs> to right. Keep, to well, keep... and the and the two hour rainstorm. You know, you just it's it's really hard to shoot outdoors. All our days had to be planned based on half days shooting in the morning because we knew every afternoon we're getting a rainstorm. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. You know, so there were a lot of times where schedules had to be rearranged and that sort of thing. Hmm. A lot of moving parts, that's for sure. So was that the biggest challenge of filming was really the weather more than anything else? Um, we took one challenge at a time. <laughs> so, I'm not going to say what the biggest one was because the biggest one was always the one we were facing currently. Um, we had just sets that came in to a uh, place at the very last minute, sometimes literally hours before we needed them in, in the case of some of them. Uh, we had some excellent people working on locations for us and including things that I wrote into the script, having no idea how we were going to... Uh, going to achieve them and uh, we had some location people who really came through and found us things like the world's largest train set in <laughs> a home so just wait you'll see it in the movie so <laughs> nice yeah oh that's great so where my train? Uh, i lost my train of thought <laughs> good timing on that one uh so where where are you filming is done Mm-hmm. So where where are you now with it? What's which which stage are we at now? So we are in consideration at numerous film festivals around the country, uh, really around the world at this point. Basically, the way the film festival the the way the film festival world works is your premiere status is the thing that the most prestigious film festivals want, um, and so we're at a we're in a position where we're we're. You can only go down the ladder, if that makes any sense. Okay, yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. So I wish we could do this sort of scatter shot. We're applying to lots of film festivals right away, so that everybody can uh, can see our you know film, and we can definitely get it out there. Um, We're kind of going down the the ladder and and waiting to see who accepts us. Um, We really should have a premiere date to announce before too long, and I can't tell you when because it's not finalized yet. But we are in the processes of organizing an Orlando screening in the future. Oh, uh, that's awesome. all I can say at this point. Yeah, we should no, have I... a date. Um, we should have a date in hopefully in about a month, uh, hopefully less than that. Obviously, keep watching Twitter and keep watching Facebook for those announcements. But uh, that would be a public screening, something that uh, you can just waltz on up and buy a ticket to, um, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah, we're hoping to do at least several of those around the country in cities that don't have film festivals or don't have sort of the right fit for us um, or, you know, don't accept us. Um, <laughs> some, some combination of those. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. You know, these film festivals are getting thousands and thousands of submissions, you know, so it's it is a, uh, you know, very small percentage that gets in. We're very fortunate in that we have a film that we believe a lot of people want to see. And that's that's going to help us with some of that. But, uh, yeah, we have to. Uh, uh, keep on keeping on, and uh, we are we are definitely making sure our, our backers in Orlando and the people who are excited there are going to get it. We're trying to organize another one of those for the uh, Anaheim area. Okay. Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be awesome, yeah. Definitely. So I have kind of a random question. Um, mm-hmm. For the character of Walt, how did, you, how did you decide how he would react to things in the Magic Kingdom? Were you able to find any information about like stuff that he liked or he didn't like, or were you just kind of guessing? I'm just curious how you, how you built that out. You know, there's always guesswork involved whenever you're doing any historical piece. And in this one, I, I really tried to approach it as a historical piece, if that makes any sense. Um, obviously the events aren't, um, but the character is my primary biography that I was working from was the, um, and I'm going to completely blank on the name, uh, Gabler, the Neil Gabler biography. Um, I, but I read five or six, um, and watched several documentaries and really tried to get as much of a grasp around the, the, the person of Walt as I possibly could before I went into this. And then after that, it really came about through the needs of the story. Um, I knew what Walt wanted, had to want in that he wanted to go see the park. And then, you know, I, I, I kind of take a more formalist view to uh, view towards screenplay writing so that if I know what the character wants, the, a lot of the stuff really drops into place. You know, so it tells me what the events that have to happen in the movie are going to be. 
you know, so so a lot of that sort of fell into place based on what I think is coming out of, of the character, part of which is obviously my creation by the, the very fact that I didn't know Walt personally. You know, I'm not that old. I was born 20 years after he died. Um, and then, uh, but but really as much research as I could possibly uh, could possibly get to firsthand accounts um, and, you know, just published biographies. Right. Nice. Now, how has... Have you gotten much feedback, or do you know kind of what the reception has been of of the trailer that's been out there, or or you know traffic on on the website or social media sites? Have has there been an has there been a buzz about it? I guess that's I can't think of another word to. Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> um, you know, uh, right after we dropped the trailer, we got contacted by several media outlets um, who wrote up stories on the project. And uh, every once in a while, I'll still get a, a mention in Twitter that one of it's been, been reposted. Um, so we got picked up by several outlets who had previously not paid attention to us. You know, uh, before when we had cast Ron and everything, we got a, a real PR blitz right then. And we really got the same effect with the trailer. You know, so it was it was pretty exciting. Awesome. Do you do you have any expectations for it once it's once it's released uh, publicly, either through film festivals or I guess that's the only way you, you could release it other than, you know, straight to DVD, I guess. What would what would consider it to be a, a, a success for you and the crew and, and everybody who who is involved in it? You know, that's always hard to quantify with something like this. Personally, my my level of success is going to be us um, being able to share this with as many people as possible. Um, you know, I don't I don't have a number in mind, um, but yeah, obviously, no. you know, we want to get this out there and, and get into a place where everyone who can who can gets to uh, experience it. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't. I got because it should have been more specific. I wasn't referring no, to like monetary wise. Like, I, yeah. I, I know that's that's not. I mean, it's obviously it'd be great to make money off it, but I know ultimately, I, I think I was I was thinking along that lines, like of seeing people's reaction to it and having and knowing that people have enjoyed it and and right. get a kick out of it. Thought it was a well done project for mm-hmm. which would seeing the trailer and and then. And then knowing you from chatting with you on Twitter and stuff like that, that's that's kind of the impression that I get because it's kind of, I think what, if I had to think, like I said, I didn't know Walt Disney either. I mean, he died ten years before I was born, so mm-hmm. if if I had to guess in knowing what I know about him, and I definitely don't have the extensive research on him as as you have done for for this project. I would think that's kind of how he would feel as well. Too. I mean, obviously, he was a businessman as well, so he, yes, he did want to make money, but I think he got joy seeing smiles on people's faces going through his park. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I the the mythos re, uh, you know, surrounding uh, Walt Disney himself is, is something that's really interesting, and I think a lot of people in, in sort of the Disney community want to portray him one way or another. And in the reality, he, there was a lot of contradictions in him. You know, he, you know, it would say one thing in public and another thing in private sometimes. And, uh, you know, just had conflicting views about how, uh, you know, money should be handled in the company. Um, but ultimately was willing to risk it all for the thing he believed in next. And sometimes that thing really worked out like Disneyland and, Sometimes that thing really didn't work out, like the sports complex in Colorado <laughs> that nobody talks about. Right. Oh, so, yeah, definitely. You know, so it's it's really interesting. I've, I've heard more cynical quotes in a lot of my research uh, <laughs> where he's walking with one of the, I think, landscapers or somebody who's, who's doing sort of finishing touches on, on some project at Disneyland and says, the guy said to him, you know, this is a great park you built here for the kids, Walt, and Walt said, for the kids, kids don't have any money. <laughs> like, you know, that's a that's a side of Walt Disney, too, assuming that quote is accurate, and I tend to believe it. So. Absolutely. No, I would think so, too. Oh, yeah. I would think so, too. Yeah, I, I think you're I, – I would have to imagine that, that that is correct. There was probably two, two completely different sides of him. You know, there was obviously the public persona and the stuff you saw on TV, Wonderful World of Disney and – and the, you know the Florida Project, uh, you know the Epcot video that everybody has seen a million times over, and anything else he did, that where he was just this overwhelmingly charming man, and you know everything was for the family, and 
and giving back and, and wanted everybody to come and enjoy themselves like that. But there also was the other side of it. If you watch numerous, I can't think of the name of it. I know I talked about it on here. There was a, a, uh, a two-part documentary I watched on, I think it was Netflix. Oh, uh, the Netflix. PBS? Yes, the PBS special, which yeah. I had ne- which I had never seen until this year. I didn't even know it existed. And I was that was fascinating to me. And I was like, wow. So, it, you know, the whole, there was just, it was just, I, that special was great because I think it dove into more detail about some of the general facts that everybody already knew about, you know, the train ride and, mm-hmm. and, how everybody had uh, the animators left him and and all the stuff like that like there was all it's all very vague stuff that's known I think by the vast majority of people but that I think went into more of like the detailed stuff of what actually happened and I found that a lot more fascinating because mm-hmm. it, it held a lot more truth I think to me than to what the general public conception is about stuff that happened you know so right right I mean he was a businessman Roy was more the businessman but you know Walt obviously wasn't you know just doing it for the sake of doing it he did also want to make money on it but he definitely was more the uh the imaginary the idea man well I I also like I I think a lot of people say things like you know Walt wasn't in it for the money and and that's that's in some ways true I think Walt viewed things differently and to him that money was freedom to do the next thing which is, I think, a, a very is almost different than the Walt would never raise prices crowd. Right, uh, right, right. Comes along, but yeah, but like if it allowed him <laughs> to build a theme park on the moon, sure, Walt would raise prices. You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I don't know what Walt would be doing in 2018 if he was still with us and you know 117 or whatever. But uh, you know, it's uh, I wish I could see it. You know, uh, it would be something crazy and wild, and it may not work, but. Uh, he would probably need money to do it. Oh so yeah, no, absolutely. Figuring out a way. Absolutely. I, I mean, you're right. It, not to get in a whole philosophical thing about Walt and how his life was portrayed, because you know, there's plenty of ways to go and research that. But yeah, I mean, if you think about it from the early first success he had, all the money he he made from Snow White. It's not like he held on to it. Yeah, he bought himself a nice house and they traveled a lot and that was known. But a majority of the money, I don't know, I'm sure there's percentages on it, went into building Disneyland. And then, and you know, how many houses did he mortgage and properties and did he put liens on or whatever to, to get the money, you know, and, and to buy it outright back from uh, ABC? Yeah, and, and you know, you know a, lot I mean? of, a lot, even to finance Snow White, he mortgaged, I think he mortgaged his house for that. And I, yeah, one of the lesser known facts is Lillian Disney was drawing up divorce papers at that time. Like it was... Right. Yeah, you know, it was a personal strain on top of everything else. Absolutely, and, uh, it, it it must be incredibly hard to come home to a you know wife who doesn't believe your film is going to be a success. It, you know, it's yeah. And in the and in the beginning of the '30s, with the depression and everything else going on, where you know, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're, people are people have nothing and less than nothing. Everybody's losing everything. And here's this guy that's, you know, trying to go on an idea with, uh, with a cartoon, which is something that had never been done before. Yeah. So I, I can only imagine the conversations that happened at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did working on this movie change your perception of Walt at all? You know, I found out so much information that it's even hard to parse sort of what I knew before this <laughs> and what I just learned. It really drove me into researching him more. And if anything, I think kind of his achievements tended to run together before and seeing them in sort of a biography format where you see each new idea emerge, you know, sound cartoons and color cartoons and, you know, yeah, full length cartoons and then these, you know, themed environments and you know, each one of these ideas kind of come about, it, it really gives you an appreciation for, he's not just innovative one time, he is innovative, it, you know, one of those achievements would be enough to, you know, earn him a place in history, right? yeah, at least film history. And he, he did 12 things that should earn him a place there. And that's, uh, that's what's really fascinating about his life. Yeah, I'll, I'll 100% agree with that, because I think that's the way I started to approach it and look at it as I got older and got into more of the history of the company, the parks, him, and like I said, watching that PBS documentary and other stuff I've, I've read and seen about him. That's, I think 
Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Ben. I, I'm pretty sure I, that's the same way I kind of went about it, too, because everything kind of seemed like it was all together. Like, he did this, this, and this, but it's all in the same realm, you know what I mean? He, he made a movie about yeah, fairy tales, and then he built a park that's based on fairy tales, and it's all kind of the same thing. But if you think about, besides those things, all the other ingenious things that came about during all that, and you, like the World's Fair stuff, and audio animatronics and the multiplane camera and all these technological advances that he's been involved in either at the forefront or even just throwing the idea out for his for imagineers and other people in the company to take it to the next level it's still mm -hmm. he's kind of still been at the at the head of the whole thing so yeah and and even more than that like it's hard now because Walt Disney owns what thirty percent of the U.S. box office or something, you know, ridiculously high. But right. this was a tiny little studio. This was not, you know, anything that should be, you know, making such monumental changes in the way the industry works. Right. Uh, you know, this was the this was the sixth studio out of the big five. You know. Like, right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was not a force to be reckoned with at any point. Really, at any point, when Walt's still alive. You know, just the number of films they're outputting, and yep. you know, today every one of them's a classic, almost. Yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. Well, if you, I mean, I, I, I think when I think about it in that respect, especially the the stuff he was involved in when he was still alive, and things during the the forties and the and the fifties. The amount of now, like I said, I, I don't know really and much about movie making or how it's done today, or even after he's been, if he was a pioneer in this in this way to doing it. But the amount of research that seems to go into films, where his team like take the the uh, the Saludos Amigos and the Three Caballeros films, where he flew whole whole teams down to South America for however long they were all down there for the research, mm -hmm. and you know taking pictures and, and video clips of, of the plant life and the and the landscape and everything else and, and making those films. And then the the short uh, films he made during the war time with Donald Duck, with the, you know, the army things and, and the and stuff like that. Like, nothing was just done to do it. Like, it was, it was done soup to nuts and to the best, if not better, than anybody else was doing anything at the time. And I'm pretty... That still holds true today. I know, you know, with... With Pixar being involved and and with the kind of the rebirth again of of Disney animation, not Pixar, but the true Disney animated films, I feel like it's kind of the new regime is kind of getting back to that, where it just seems like they're just full on into everything, like stuff they used to do at MGM Studios when it was a working studio and you used to do that backlot tour and you saw them working on stuff, and if you were lucky enough, you saw additional props or animals or things in there that they were for the movies and the storyboards they were working on. So, you know, like I said, I don't know if every studio, do, I'm sure there is some research done, but I, I, I just feel like they go above and beyond, or at least I'm, that's what I like to think. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Like it, this, if you could, if you could just own one studio tomorrow, even if their box office may vary a little bit from year to year and month to month, like there's no way to look at even what the Disney company is doing now. And I'll be the first to line up with some criticisms, but uh, I mean, you know, Marvel. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, I know. They, yeah, they took a, essentially a company that nobody wanted, and you know, turned it into something bigger than Star Wars. To a juggernaut. Yeah, no, you're a hundred percent right. You're hundred percent right. I, I was thinking about it the other day, or I don't know, maybe we were speaking on on here one day before. I, I've we, a couple weeks ago, we were running through all the movies that were coming out within the rest of this year and in 2019, both all, all across the whole spectrum. The, mm -hmm. the 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 remakes they're doing, the live action remakes, Marvel movies, and Star Wars movies. There's some pretty decent ones that Disney itself are doing, but I, I think I'm honestly more excited for some of the Marvel movies. It's just like it's something I'd never ever thought I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I I love like for me personally, and it's way off topic, but the the two Guardians of the Galaxy movies have got to be my the most favorite movies that have come out since the Pirates mm -hmm. movies. I I mean I I can't even deny it. Those movies are fantastic, and re and to me have ridiculous rewatchability because I I mean, you know, I'm sure there's there's people that are on the opposite end of that spectrum, but. You know, to each their own, but, uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, that's a good segue, since we were um, speaking of complaining. 
not that I'm saying you're going to complain about <laughs> it, but uh, so <laughs> I, I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, current events, I guess, in in, in the parks. I, I don't know if you've if ever been out to Disneyland, but as far as for Walt Disney World, with some of the new stuff that's come on in the past few years and newer stuff that's coming very soon, which is, I don't know if you've seen Pandora yet since you've been down there. I have not. Some of the, some of the rest mm-hmm. of us, most of the rest of us have. Like, what do you think? Like, so you you went, you were going about the same time I was going as as, as kids. So compared to, I, I know you can't compare then to now, but, and I know you have a young child or children. So going <laughs> going now, when you weren't going on research trips, if you were going with your family, like, how, how do you, what do you think? Are you excited for stuff for your kids or, or are you kind of how I, how like, at least my gotcha. co- co-hosts like to call me where I'm like, like the grumpy old guy that goes now because all the cool stuff is gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are huge pluses and there are huge minuses. Um, and it's just something we as sort of fans are going to have to live with for the near future until there's a, re- a regime change. And my guess is when there's a regime change, they're not going to be the Michael Eisner version anymore. You know, they, it's going to be somebody else's vision for what the parks are as an extension of the, the company. Um, I don't know if we're going to, it's going to be better or worse, but, uh, you know, right now, obviously everything is funded and financed and created by intellectual property. Yeah. Um, you know, it is what it is. I, I'm not excited about Toy Story Land. Um, I think it's a huge missed opportunity. I, you know, it's, it's hard, but on the other hand, like I love Disney Springs and I think that's overlooked by the fans a lot. That transformation that Disney Springs underwent my hope is that like throughout the 60s everyone was trying to make build cheap knockoffs of disneyland throughout the country you know six flags was you got you got a lot of parks that if you look at their history it was kind of like you know so and so was a businessman who took his family to california and came back and wanted to build his own disneyland Yeah, yeah yeah i hope that disney springs is going to be the new version of that i hope that in five years we have businessmen who are ripping off disney springs left and right and building their own version in in their backyard because to me that's a huge like it's a fantastic in, themed environment shopping experience that you that is replicatable. Um, oh, it's a hundred percent rec. Well, I I know where I am in, in Connecticut. And I'm very close to New York City. I'm only a forty five minute train ride out of New York City. So, in the respect with Disney Springs is I we I literally have that any within multiple places the, it's uh, you know for lack of a better word a giant mall all high-end shops and then with tons of different dining experiences the, the dining may yep. not there are is not not as much and as high-end as mm-hmm. as all the offerings there but you do have that general experience the only downfall is it's in the northeast and seven months out of the year you're inside because the weather sucks right <laughs> you know so you're not right. hang, you're not getting that hangout and vacationy type feel but that I wasn't on board with the whole Disney Springs things only because I went to Pleasure Island because I was old enough. Right. And I enjoyed it there, and I liked everything there, the comedy club and the adventurers club. And I didn't go to any of the dance clubs because I don't care for that type of music. But that other stuff was fun and just the general party atmosphere, walking around and stuff. <laughs> and I liked the west side and the, and, and the downtown. Shopping is shopping. It is what it is. It's not my favorite thing to do, but so I just don't go to that area. But... I do like the restaurants built up and the live entertainment that's out there, and there is definitely a lot of more offerings. Like I said, the shopping part I could care less about because I can I have all those stores near me. I recognize yeah. that most of the rest of the country does not. A mall mm-hmm. isn't something that's in everybody's backyard, so it is exciting for some people to go on vacation, especially spending the money going to Walt Disney World, and it's like, wow, let's go and go to these stores that – Unless I go online, I'm never going to step foot in. And and I get it. And they're gearing mm-hmm. towards those people, and that's fine. It just, for me personally, it just doesn't it doesn't do anything for me. No, that's fair. That's fair. And as far as the Toy Story thing goes, I, I, I don't know. I guess I see both sides of it, but I also haven't... I haven't done a ton of looking at what is going to be there. Like, I know the attractions that are going to be there and stuff like that. I've seen the, the art and the concept art, but I guess I haven't dived completely into it only because i know when i get there number one i can't go into it thinking that way and like looking for the flaws because then my 13 year old is going to be looking at it the same way my 10 year old and then i have a five year old as well 
So I try to go into things now as me being 42, as going into it as I'm walking in there looking through my children's eyes. Mm -hmm. Because if I go in there and be like, oh, this was so much better when I was a kid. They had this, they had this and this. And then I, then I feel like my, my kid, especially my older one, because, you know, 13-year-olds are impressionable in every way possible, mm -hmm. is going to be like, oh, well, my dad said that this was better then, so this is <laughs> this is going to be stupid. You know what I mean? I don't know. I could be yeah. overthinking it, but that's the, kind of the way I'm looking at it. So mm -hmm. who knows? Yes, I'm, I, 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 I do see lots of missed opportunities that they could have done, especially with probably the franchise behind cars that they've probably made the most money out of <laughs> with those <laughs> movies. I mean, yeah, there's probably was a million and one different things. They could have really plussed well, that area to, to give a fuller experience. I guess my big, my big problem with the, the toy story area is it's underbuilt. Like it's just ridiculous for what that park needs, which is a bunch of attractions that the entire family can ride. Like, Okay, you failed. <laughs> like, if, if, what you what you need is a bunch of attractions everybody can ride. What you're giving us is a flat ride and, and a, a family coaster with That's a 42 it. inch height limit. Right. Or, I, I don't yeah. think it might it's that high. It might be a little shorter. I but think still. it's. I think it's. I the think same. it is 42. No, 42? I th I, no, I think it's the same as uh, Mine Train. I think it was 38. Oh, from okay. what I saw, wow. I could be wrong, be but good. I'm pretty sure it was 38 because you can't build it as a family coaster and put it at 42. Right. But would it have been harder to put in two more flat rides? I mean, that I guess that's my. Would no, that have, I agree would that with was you. what was going to blow the bank open, wide open. Um, I, my choice for that area, and I actually said it before Toy Story Land was announced, was to build Mickey's Toontown out here, which I think would have been logical given the Hollywood theme. Yes. You could have connected it to Sunset Boulevard and taken out that area. But you know, they they decided to go a different direction. But they they didn't go a direction that solves the problem which is that there's nothing for kids to do in that park yeah no you're uh, right when you think about it in that respect you're right because the, the, the toontown thing would have been a great idea but even even if they kept with the toy story theme and made it kind of like what dino land is maybe not a full carnival type thing but a spin you know they have it they do have some of a spinner but yeah I, I get it yeah there's there's not enough things there's not enough attractions i mean there's more or along the, or along the lines of what cars land is in california adventure do we have a timeline super... do we have a timeline on the great mickey movie ride remake thing that's not been announced and Nothing my yet. guess okay. is yeah it, it, my guess is it's after toy story land then because like we're getting up on toy story <sighs> land supposed yeah. to opening Right. I, that that's the other thing that drives me crazy. You took out, you a took out ride. one. Of, you took out a good ride when you had space. You didn't right. have I to know. take out that ride. Yeah, there was no right. reason yeah. to do that. Yeah, I, I think that ride needed to hit the chopping block eventually, but hit the chopping block after Star Wars lands opens. Yeah. you know, and, and replace it with something else. Like you could have thrown up an empty steel structure. You have an empty steel structure right back at the end of Sunset Boulevard. That's right. Like, mm -hmm. It, it, it's holding holding dance parties occasionally. Like yeah, exactly. you could have thrown it up in there. You didn't have to take out great movie ride. Right, right. right. You have four rides running in that park now. Yep. Yeah, that was and, very odd timing. And it and it and it's still you know full price to get in there, which you know right. they're not. But well, you know they're not going to cut the cut the cost in half. But that's you know that's the way people look at it now. Well, I I, I hope she doesn't listen to this because I'm about to make fun of a relative of mine. No, uh, but okay. they they went on vacation. <laughs> they uh, they were looking at the the various offerings of the park, and they had um, they had decided that they were going to do you know Epcot and Animal Kingdom and Magic Kingdom. It's like that's great. You know they had three days to spend there, and then they decided eh, Epcot looks it uh, doesn't look fun for the kids. Let's do Hollywood Studios. <laughs> Everything oh, I can do short so of awesome. saying you're choosing the wrong thing. Yeah. But, oh, like, I would have uh, totally said that they were choosing the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, asking me for advice. And I'm trying to be as you know helpful as possible. But like, I, they went today. I need to actually check in and see what happened. <laughs> <laughs> they probably finished an hour and a half. Do we I need to take like, over their My Disney Experience account and just make just, the Fast Passes for exactly. them? <laughs> Oops, I made the Fast Passes for Epcot instead. Absolutely. Wow. Well, someone told them the Frozen sing-along was the thing worth going to, to Hollywood Studios for. Like, <laughs> it, okay. I'm, I mean, no. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. It's good and it's funny. It was it's funny, good. but it was funny. Yeah, I mean, no, there is. Fun. 
I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's not worth. It's not worth going to the park if you've got three days. No. It's not. Worth- no. No, I'm not. Ste- I'm not stepping foot inside oh. that park in three days, and you know, and depending on the age of your kids, you 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 know, I hate to say it because it's my favorite park. It's you, you don't really need to do Epcot. I would do two Magic Kingdoms and one Animal Kingdom. Depending Honestly, on, you're you're dep- probably right. Depending on the age of the kids, because I right. mean. I don't know. I mean, there's not a ton of attraction ride based things at Epcot now, too, because that's going to that, that park, unfortunately, after Star Wars Land is open, is going to turn into the studios of its time while it goes through its transformation, which is going to sadden me to no end. But the advantage <laughs> Epcot has is that it has a lot of rides. I mean, so if you take out a right. bunch of rides, you still have a bunch, you know, a lot of rides open. True. And um, and the whole and the whole right side of uh Epcot's reversed when you look at it from a map, but if the yeah. whole, so I guess it's technically the west side, even though it's, you know, if you're walking under land Spaceship side Earth, or test track side, the right. land, the land side, <laughs> I imagine no, nothing's getting touched there as far as the seas, the land, and imagination. I'm imagination. sure eventually, but while they're doing whatever, while they're doing Guardians of the Galaxy and whatever's happening with Wonders of Life Pavilion. <laughs> Uh, kind of the other stuff that's there is is not going anywhere. I don't think during right. these construction and spaceship Earth, obviously. So who knows what happened so, then? So yeah, you've got five high capacity solid attractions that are going to keep on chugging through right. just Future World. So yes. even mm-hmm. even if they took out Test Track, which they're not going to, but even right. if that that goes down, you still have quite a bit of capacity Absolutely. in that park. Absolutely, yeah, because then you got the two boat rides in World Showcase. Yeah, you know, you know, people eaters. Well, Frozen isn't so much of a people eater because it's a slow load and unload. But uh, Grand Fiesta is just a, you know, that that's just yeah. a constant moving thing. I was predicting the absolute worst for Frozen, and the lines have not been what I was fearing. So they're doing some some good black magic on that fast pass system or something. Yeah, you're right. Because <laughs> you're right. <laughs> they're they're really rarely over thirty five minutes, and that's what Pooh can get up to in the middle of the day. So exactly. <laughs> well, I don't think that the main attraction at Epcot really is the rides. That's not why me and my family go. You know what I mean? We ride rides, obviously, but it's more about exploring and eating. That's true. And That's true. <laughs> it has other yeah. attractions or other things. Adult slushies. That's right. Yeah. right. Wonderful things like that. <laughs> it's all about the food and the wine. What I will say is going with my, my toddler and preschooler, I got the Epcot's not for kids feeling for the first time <laughs> on, on a trip because it like the level of FOMO that ferments if you've got a toddler and a preschooler where do I want to wait in this 10 minute line where I'm going to potentially get screamed at by a child or do I just <laughs> want to like walk sadly by the line for the alcoholic slushies. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so I really, like, that was the only time where I felt like I'm really missing out by bringing children here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I hear you. But most of the time... It's such a great it's, place. Yeah. Why would we bring no, kids? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who let kids in here? Who invited the kids? I know, right? <laughs> but obviously, you know, kids get older and, and hopefully a little bit better behaved and uh, you can you can do things, or like... they grow up into RJ. <laughs> That's right, and then and then wow. the cho- and then the children watch me on vacation to make sure that I behave. Regardless, <laughs> good. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions for Ben about his uh, about his project? So we've got the um, the festival circuit announcements hopefully coming up soon. This is a Disney-esque project, so all good Disney movies have sequels. <laughs> <What's the next laughs> thing? Oh, no. No. Walt, Walt said you can't beat pigs with pigs. <laughs> you know? It's like, still... <laughs> maybe not sequel, maybe follow-up or <laughs> next big thing. Uh, I... If if you guys would be the first to know if I have a next pick, <laughs> send him to Disneyland and have him be disgusted with Pixar Pier. <laughs> Very good. I'll write the script for Jessica you. Jessica will do it for free. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll pencil that in. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, what another podcast I did? The, the one of the hosts offered to uh, do it as a comic book. So oh, okay, <laughs> nice. Which might, that might would be, more be good. Fun. Good graphic novel. Yeah. 
Nice. <laughs> all right, so before we wrap up, Ben, why don't you give us all the ways we can find you, the movie, and anything else you want to let everybody know about. Well, um, you can follow Walt himself on Twitter at Walt's Frozen Head, no Owen Frozen. And you can also go to Facebook.com slash Walt's Frozen Head. Uh, the Twitter is Walt in character, I suppose, uh, tweeting about the events of the day and the news stories and making jokes and, uh, you know, making fun of Bob Iger and that sort of thing. <laughs> um, and uh, the Facebook is more movie news, some press clippings. And honestly, we post there a lot less. But uh, you should hopefully be following both if you're on both platforms. Um, and uh, the the site is waltzfrozenhead.com as well if you want to go check that out, though mostly that's old press releases and uh, the trailer. Uh, but if you want to see the trailer, um, youtube.com, uh, so just search for the trailer there. You'll run into it. Or just search Waltz Frozen Head on Google and you'll find us many different ways. Excellent. Yes, the uh, the Twitter handle is a lot of fun. I know I engage and in the nonsense and uh and play along with everything and it, it's 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 a lot of fun in a day and age where there seems to be a lot of misery and <laughs> and things of that nature in the disney <laughs> twitter community at least oh, well. <laughs> the, the facebook stuff i don't do as much as well either i'm sure it's out there i just don't participate in any of it uh twitter is enough <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I would thank you, Ben, again for coming on. This was really, really a lot of fun. Uh, you're welcome anytime, and yeah, definitely when you get any sort of news, uh, drop me a line or any of us a line, and we will push it out through our uh, Twitter handles and everything to uh, get the word out and get people to uh, come and see it whenever and, and wherever you uh, get it out there. Without definitely, doubt. definitely. All right, so with that being said, we are going to wrap this episode up. We thank everybody for listening, and we'll talk to you all next week. Follow our troop at www.dizexplorers.com, where you can find all the links for all our hosts' social media accounts. You can also follow the podcast on our Facebook group at The Diz Explorers and on Twitter and Instagram at The Diz Explorers. You can download this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Podbean, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher Radio, and also on YouTube. Thanks for listening.